I'm Ryan Haug. It's my brother. Michael Haug. Uh, together, uh, we farm and ranch east of Barnesville, Minnesota. Um, fourth generation operation, uh, cow calf with a finished feed lot, and uh, we also farm corn, soybeans, wheat, and barley, and alfalfa, uh, right around 2,200 acres. And uh, we've been doing no-till for about six years now, uh, incorporating cover crops and soil health practices, uh, rotational grazing, um, intensive livestock management, uh, trying to uh, do what we can to improve our soil and our operation. At the end of the day, the bottom of the line. Well, Jeff, do you want to tell us about who you are and what you do and how you work with all of these gentlemen? Okay. Uh, Jeff Duchesne, uh, grazing specialist for NRCS. Uh, so I mainly work with uh, livestock producers on pasture management. So I don't know, I think I started working with both the hogs and the gromishes about the same time. I think probably about, what, maybe five, six, seven years ago, something like that. Yeah, we did ours in 15, so I think you must have been around here in 14 then. And yeah, I think that was about the same. Yeah, 14 when we started with you. Yep. Yeah, yep, yep. So I've worked with all these, uh, all these guys on projects on their pastures, uh, looking at uh, developing a grazing plan that will fit their needs and then they just just kept working on other projects after that, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, to these guys is credit. We're a little bit old still. I don't, Will and I don't just get on the internet and, you know, and research a whole bunch like our kids and stuff do. So, when, I mean, when we want to deal with somebody, we want to deal with them face to face. Well, these two were available and, and we knew they're, you know, we knew they knew what they're talking about and they'd, they'd help us out, you know, because we'd already, we'd had a few projects with them. Yeah. Well, it's been kind of fun to see like the different things you guys, all of you have done since we started, <laughs> you know, working together how many years ago. Uh, of course, you know, Ryan and Michael, you guys are already, um, I think, just starting no-till, I think, already. And 2014 is when we started in on that. We really just kind of jumped in over our heads a little bit for a while there. <laughs> yeah. Most people dip their little toe in first, or maybe the big toe, and I just shove Michael in. I'm like, I'm coming, you know. <laughs> so. so what made you decide that that was something you wanted to try, that soil health was something worth giving a go? Uh, well, it was like that 2013, 14 area there, and we bought a quarter of land for my father-in-law. And uh, it was so wet, I mean, we, we wound up PPing it that year. So, uh, we couldn't get in to plant it. And then we tiled it that summer. And uh, then I was trying to figure out what we should do with it. And I had heard about NRCS and Equip uh, for cover crop. And I thought, well, they'll, hell, they'll pay me to, to plant that. You know, that's great and free money. You know, so I signed up for that and, and drug my feet and drug my feet and made sure, just, just set it up for failure. You know, waited until the last day to plant it. You know, and didn't, didn't really want it to succeed and uh, got it planted and then it never really caught, got a good catch or anything. And, and that ground blew that winter, open winter. And, and it just, I mean, there was a dust storm coming off that ground and that was a real eye opener uh, for me. And, and we hadn't really experienced soil like that. Um, it's completely different. Lake, Lake Agassiz, Beach Ridge, sand, uh, sandy soils down there that, that uh, were different than the clay-based loam, so, loams that we're used with to east of town. And, uh, just kind of realizing and we that that can't happen again that's that is not going to happen and, and i kind of got on the internet and found uh you know gabe brown and, and some of those guys and and really just kind of dove into the youtube videos that were out there on soil health and cover crops and what those guys were doing and one thing led to the next and and you just you know got introduced to more people you know, some of those pioneers of, of the soil health industry you know ray archuleta and and, and some of those guys and um just really drank the Kool-Aid and, and I told Mike, you better start drinking this with me because <laughs> I'm, I'm heading there. And uh, definitely some resistance to begin with, I think. But you've come a long, long ways, haven't you? So what was your hesitation? Yeah, we don't screw this all up for the most part, you know, just kind of raised the old school way like Dave and Willie there, you know, just that's what we've been doing and well, change is gonna have to happen, so. Just kind of nose into it a little bit, and he kind of wanted to jump in faster, and I wanted to see it. But 
And I went along with it, so. And what it's do you working. Think? <laughs> what do you think now? Now that you're, you know, three, four, five years out? I think it's a good deal. A lot of people think we're nuts for what we do. and It won't work down south of town. I've been told that many times, but Ryan's proven that everybody can work, so. Yeah, I don't know how many people have told us that you can't no-till that ground south of town, that Lake Agassiz Beach soil. Well, it's just, it'll just seal up on you. That'll never work, and it's just the exact opposite. It's, it's starting to mellow out now, and yeah. you know we've been no-tilling that ground for since 2015 on that farm. And I think a lot of soils have to go through a stage, mm -hmm. you know, to, I don't know, get better. I mean, like you said, certain soils do seal up, but, you know, if you get the right locale, okay, humus or whatever in the ground to keep it airy, so to speak, uh, it works, I guess. And I guess, you know, time will tell on all pieces of, excuse me, <clears throat> on all pieces of ground, but, it doesn't happen overnight, so, so that, that's that's probably the main thing. Well, last year was a wet year, and it was very trying to get some of the harvest done. But you guys had some uh, no-till ground. What was your experience? Yeah. We no-tilled all of our all of our beans last year, and it was a tough soybean year. And I called Mark one day and I told him I said, "Geez, this is this is a little bit weird because we're combining our beans and our combine tires are wet, but we never really left any ruts on much of anything. You know, just." Just, just little spots here and there that we had to clean up with our vertical tillage, but for the most part, we were we combined every acre like it was no big deal. You know where the neighbors were. If you weren't, if you didn't have some, some, like you said, a little bit of a uh, couple years of uh, sod building there or whatever, uh, you know the comp. The, there's just no holding capacity there for any machinery. It was neighbors were getting stocked up to the frame and this and that. We were, we had no problem. It was that was a huge plus for us. But. And watching the neighbors, you know you. You could just about tell where their tillage practice was, how deep they went, or how deep their tillage, or how deep they sank when they were out there trying to combine or do whatever in the wet conditions. You know, so if you were down to your axle, well, you know, there's a reason why. It's, yeah. If you're stuck for a reason, put it that way. We've seen a lot of the same things last fall where we were able to carry just, we had that soil structure was there to, to help carry the combine and the grain cart and, and that sort of thing. And, and you look across the road and neighbors were leaving ruts from one end of the field to the other. You know, uh, it, I think that should speak volumes. We finished corn last year, 23rd of October, and we've got guys that are got corn to combine yet today. You know, just, but we never, same way, we, we went across all of it. Probably the biggest reason though that we started doing more cover crops and, and uh, no-till is uh, even our ground depth. We got, we're a little bit opposite of these guys. We got some real sandy, the ground that they're talking about south of town, we have a lot of that. The real sandy, flat type of ground, you know, and wet sand kind of stuff. And whereas it's really tough to get a crop established in it. If you, if you plant it and you get an inch of rain or something later, it seals up so bad. And uh, when it gets hot like this week is gonna be, it, it, the high spots, they, they're guaranteed to burn off. And the low spots, when you got, these half inch rains or two inches of rain, the low spots would, they would hold water and drowned out. And now that same exact ground, you know, just half a dozen years later, is the tops are in the bottom, it's all nice and lush. Corner to corner, it made a huge difference. And I think it, I was just going through some of our soil tests and you know, we got, like our pasture out west, the organic matter is 9.7, you know, we got, you know, we got a couple that are low yet in it, down in the three and a half, and that is some of the lower producing ground, but most of our organic matters are, around that five and a half now, you know, and we're, we're, that's pretty good. So that's five and a half organic matter this week is gonna be good for, you know, that's just like a sponge holding water, you know. It, it seems like some of these things that we've been doing have really evened out the fields. Completely. It's taken those extremes away from the high, high ground that would dry up and the low ground that would drown out. Yeah. And it really has evened them out. And one major factor that we'll both be pretty happy about is that it took the rock picking out of the program. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, you really, I mean, we would chisel yeah. plow and work ground and we don't have a piece of ground that we didn't have to chase after with the ATV or the rock bucket on the loader. And we just, it was incredible how much time we'd spend rock picking and not and never to get them all. And now with the no-till drill and the roller and stuff, we just, we ain't, we ain't doing that. We're not, I mean, I don't, we haven't had a rock bucket on our loader in a couple of years now. If only our fathers would have went no-till, we wouldn't oh. have to pick rocks as kids. It was so miserable. <laughs> it was, it was, that was, 
you know, we'll, we'll both, it was just, we've, that was a part learned. of our growing up we just couldn't handle. Mm -hmm. It was tough, it was no we've, fun. We've learned we don't like to pick rocks. Yeah. <laughs> so much of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, the only rock picking we did in this year is where they spread manure out of the barnyard. We got, right. That seemed our rock scheme to work up in the barnyard yeah, there. Yeah, we did that. That's the only rocks we really picked this year. Yeah. Of course, they're all on top of the ground because the spreader threw them out, you know. <laughs> but our farm and your farm are doing kind of the same thing. We're covering, you know, that amount of ground now with two people full time and, uh, you know, some part time help on harvest and this and that. We're growing up here, we, you know, we had five, six people around running equipment all, you know, all summer long. You know, it just, it just took a lot more manpower to, you know, to dig ground, to, to put in hydrosun in the fall, to, you know, to pick rock and just. To, you know, you'd have two, two tractors going with field cultivators on, and yeah, it's just, things have definitely changed. So time savings, let's talk a little bit more Huge about time that. time savings, yeah. Well, no doubt uh, Roundup or glyphosate chemicals have saved a lot of time, you know, for time saving too, because when we were growing up, I mean, I remember having to fight quite grass problems, and well, what's, what's the way that they always used to dig out quark, or uh, get rid of quark grass, dig. Well, yeah. you dig, then, then you're going to end up having blowing fields. And I mean, we're spreading many bales of straw on many pieces of ground to keep it from blowing. Yeah. You don't see that. We don't do that anymore. So. No, we would go spread round bales in the back of the pickup with pitchforks and goggles, you know, on, on knobs and stuff. And, you know, just and in two weeks, two weeks ago here, we had a stretch of 90 some degree weather with 40 mile an hour winds for, for a whole, full, almost days. a full week, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. We never had an acre moving. I'm, you guys never had an acre moving, but boy, it, there was a lot of ground moving around here. It was, yeah. For stuff that was fully planted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that was surprising to see how the soil was blowing for having drops that far. That late the in the season, yeah. <laughs> it, it was, there was corn, there was dirt moving in, you know, in corn that was a foot tall. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, that, and it certainly wasn't doing that corn any good, you know, or nothing either. You know. Well, there's soybean fields that just got sandblasted off south of us there. Right, right. I mean, just sand, literally sandblast, nothing but the stem left. Took the leaves right off it, you know. So you, that's got to speak volumes to <clears throat> the community at large and, and your neighbors who maybe haven't adopted the practices that you guys have. So has that maybe changed the perception of soil health a little bit? Do you get more folks stopping? Yeah, but that, that won't work. That won't work on my farm. You know, that doesn't yeah. work on my farm. That's all you hear. You know, that's what a lot of people are thinking. Yeah. You know, just, they don't, sometimes it doesn't get past them. And, you know, it takes one guy, you know, in a little different part of the area to see that and say, well, gosh, what are they doing different over there? And maybe that will work and, and then try it, you know. But too many people, too often, you know, I'd seen a deal the other day, a friend sent me the, the most expensive words in agriculture, the way we've always done it. And, and we got to get past that mindset because there's thing, things have to change or there isn't going to be any agriculture for, for my grandkids. Let's talk about those changes too. So not only are we seeing issues with uh, the markets um, and just overall costs, but have you guys noticed a change in, in weather that you're experiencing and how, you know, you just talked about 90 degrees and 40 mile an hour winds, but we just had a huge weather system move through the state here. Yeah. How have you noticed your acres respond differently to these change in weather patterns that we've seen? Yeah. We're glad we're ahead of the curve there. Because like we said, we just talked about the soil erosion with wind erosion and these big rains that we're getting like that. We're not having the gully washing in, in the valleys you know, either. We're, 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 we're kind of hitting that head on both ways for wind and, and gully erosion, soil erosion that way. And like I said, you know, we just don't know when this is going to shut off. You know, July and August around here get pretty dry, you know, and, and we're going to be pretty happy that we got some cover on the ground there, you know, that it hasn't been tilled. Or if we get a wet fall, you know, we'll be, we'll hopefully be in the same position we were last year. We'll, we'll get across it. Yeah. You can't market it until you got it harvested. That's, you know, and that's, if somebody else is having trouble, that's your benefit usually, you know, the, yeah. Plus, you know, I mean, we graze a lot of our corn stalks. That corn's that I get off first. You know, we can't can't be fighting that either. You know, and then the cows are held up and eating a different alternative source. Yeah, if you're not grazing out there, free grazing, then you're feeding them. So yeah, you know, that so takes it, away from your feed supply for the the whole plan. Yeah, the whole plan has to work. You know, it has to work together, and the timing is is got to stay pretty consistent. 
Yeah. How about you guys? Have you noticed? Are you able, timing wise, to do things on time? Are you kind of on schedule with your neighbors? The last few years. I think as far as you know, timing and getting into the fields, you know, it, it varies so regionally. You know, even you know, like we farm some stuff that's you know, Lake Agassiz beach sands all the way to heavy gumbo clays to gravel knobs of the gravel pit in the corner of the field. Um, so we, it seems like we could always have some place where we can go uh, to get started. And uh, you know, there's some times where, you, where we think we're behind in getting out there. Uh, and it, most of the time it's not because the field wasn't ready, it's because we weren't ready, you know, at that point. But uh, for the most part, we've been, feel like we've been on par uh, with a lot of our neighbors as far as getting in there and sometimes we're able to get in there sooner after a rain event in the spring you know if we get shut down uh, from a rain it seems like we're able to get out there maybe a day or two sooner uh, after that uh, just because we have that soil structure to carry and, and if we're you know if we're going beans into, into cereal rye that's green and living you know we're definitely able to get down there a lot sooner because uh, that rye and that that residue is just uh, carries the equipment much better um, we're able to get in there and get things planted. Um, it seems like having that residue on the soil, um, you know, sometimes some years it feels like it's it's keeping us held back just a little bit because the soil's a little bit cooler. You know, our, our no-till beans, you know, it's best to not even look look at them until after the 4th of July because they look kind of tough and rough and, and that, but you know, I don't really care what they look like in the month of June. I care what they look like in October when they're coming through the combine. And, and that seems to be where it's really paying off. So when it gets hotter and drier, that's when you start to see. Yeah, our, our hilltops don't burn up near as fast as they used to, and you know, I think it goes back to that you know that low grounds not drowning out as much anymore, and the, and the hilltops aren't drying up anymore. We really kind of evened up to some of those fields that have had those extremes and in, in all in the same field. We've also changed our planting rates too, mm -hmm. find a little less, a little more here and there. So yeah. try not try to save on the moisture there too. So. You got the variable rate on your planter? Yeah, you know? everything we do for seeding and fertilizer is all variable rate on our planter. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're adjusting corn populations, you know, from 36,000 in the good ground to all the way down to, you know, 18, 20,000 on the hilltops. Uh, and just the opposite on our soybeans. We're actually planting, you know, quite a bit higher rates on, on the hilltops to try to force those beans to grow a little bit taller. And then we're cutting way back on the low ground, you know, down to 120,000 in the low ground to uh, help prevent the white mold from setting in it seems like that that's been an issue uh, for us in the, in the hills with little, the hollows and stuff a little higher moisture environment and um, that that sure helped our, our yields even out too.